To the kids who might be struggling, you ask the appropriate question for them so they can answer and participate. So sometimes that doesn't give you a clear understanding of the overall comprehension level. Yep. And so, because they can answer the question you ask them, because you kind of staged it that way and kind of go through. But then when the whole class has to answer that final question, you can really see separating it yes and no, who gets it, who doesn't. And then, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice. Do you ever do it with the post it notes? They, and yeah. I always like to use the post it notes, and I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but. When I gave you the post-it note, it's so much more, it's less intimidating than using a piece of paper because those little low achievers, they're like, I have to fill that whole page, I have to do all that. If you give them a little post-it note, it doesn't seem like they have to put a lot of information on the post-it note. So I usually just gave them a post-it note and they'd have to stick it on the door. And if they didn't feel comfortable, they could just stick it on my desk. You know? And then I would just take them. And really, you don't have to keep them, it's just gauging. And if you found any that you'd really like to keep, I just wonder if anyone's ever used a tic-tac-toe um, as a method as well. Because yeah. then you can put uh, in the center the, the item or question you really want to assess. 
and then around that, it can be a variety of questions. So you may have struggled with various different partners, so they can answer questions that they can be successful with. So it's just another way of, of doing it. So they can make the line in any direction, but you might say you have to go to the center. So it doesn't matter which way they go, they still answer that one question you're looking at, but they may still have an opportunity. You can do that not necessarily as an exit stuff, you can do that as a classroom activity, I guess, as a way to differentiate that, kind of I guess. And especially at this school, too, because you guys have a lot of high achievers at this school. They could all, they can do all around that. They're going to love to do that. They're going to go all around there and do all those questions. So you could put a couple, you could put a couple challenging questions for your, for your rich students. But yeah, Mark, that's really neat because um, that's what they were talking about at the, the Sutter team meetings this year, is trying to get teachers to use more tic-tac-toe. So I can bring you some examples and we can do that in the classroom if you want me to come in. I can get some tic-tac-toe activities. So summative assessment. I think we're all pretty pretty well versed on summative. That's some, that's what happens at the end of the curriculum, uh, at the end of the learning of the outcomes. Multiple choice mental math, quiz and story answer, fill in blanks, true false. They all need to be exposed to that because guess what? That's that's part of life. That's part of assessment, and you need to have familiarity with that. So the difference between formative is again, it's ongoing. Summative is the end. So for assessment to be helpful, we need to know, students need to know what they've done well, what they need to work upon, and what they need to do next in order to improve. So using those self-assessments and the various forms of formative and summative assessments are going to help them. Thank you, Harry Wong. The students know what they are to learn. You increase the chances that they will learn. So not just putting the curriculum outcome on the wall, but talking about that, having them reflect on what they're actually learning in class. I don't know about you, but as a parent, what did you do in school today? Nothing. What's going on? I don't get anything from them. But then when he said to me the other day, he said, oh, we did something We did something about reading the self. I'm, I'm going to read the self tonight. So, oh, okay, so that's day with five, right? Because I'm so out of the, the literacy wrong. Right? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, we're doing... Read to self, and we have to think about, you know, if we like read to self, and we have to improve. I'm like, okay. So they were talking about that in the classroom and, and talking about the importance of it. So I thought that was pretty neat. Numeracy nets. So it's a good formative assessment, it's good for summative assessment, and I think, yeah. There's a K-2 numeracy net that just came out, and it's going around now. Susan has it. Susan, can you just hold it up so everybody can see? This just came out this year, and they've compiled K-1 and 2 all together. And it's excellent. It's correlated right to your curriculum. It's right, right to your curriculum outcomes. It follows the grade 3, the grade 4, the grade 5. Um, I was talking to Travis about this earlier. Um, what Bev James and Ellen Palmer and Diana Keefe are doing, there are three other mentors in the district, they, what they've done to make numeracy nets a little bit more user friendly is they've taken all of the checkpoint indicators for every grade. So for example, for grade three, they've taken the checkpoint indicators, they've correlated which ones like to the long-term planning document, and they're putting them all on one big spreadsheet. So it's really neat, and it's going to be a great visual for you to see where the strengths and weaknesses are for your students. It's, it's going to be great. It's coming up soon. They're trying to roll it out to a couple pilot schools right now, and they're working on it. There's uh, and Centennial's doing it this afternoon right now. And it's excellent. So really, take a look at your numeracy nets. The thing that I like best about numeracy nets is that once you test once you do a diagnostic for a checkpoint to see if they understand numbers up to 20, if they don't get it, they have a list of resources. They'll say, go to First Steps, page 23, try activity 2. Go to John Vanderwall's book, page whatever, do this activity. So it's not just telling you to go to some random resource. It's telling you to go to a specific activity of a specific resource. And that's the great thing about it, because who has time to go and try to find out how they're going to solve it? these misconceptions and these problems. So it relates to math makes sense, first steps, prime, math focus, and van der Waal. So there's five resources that you can go to. So in your school, I know that there are first steps books in the photocopy room. I saw them there. And there should be some van der Waal books picking around here. Oh, and Kathy Fosno's in there too. They also correlate specifically to what Fosno activities to do. 
How many people have their own uh, first half stuff? For math, you mean? Yeah. We don't have all the different strands, though. Okay. Just we just have the numbers and operations. Yeah, I think there's one. There's algebra and geometry in the Photoshop room, maybe. I think I saw something like that there. I'm not sure. I'm just kind of looking around there. Because I know they were supposed to. Remember geometry? If you were interested in geometry, I could definitely show you because I have a few. And you don't need the training to have those books. So could we have them ordered? For us for us I would love to order them for you. Mark would give me his credit card. <laughs> could we ask Mark to order them? <laughs> Yeah, really good first step. So you have that here, and the the Vanderbilt books should be kicking around. I know every every school has. The, there's a K to three Vanderbilt book. I think I have a picture of it here. There it is. So this is the K to three. They do the Student Center Mathematics, and then there's the three spots. So one other resource for the K-2 teachers, because I, I kind of feel guilty because sometimes like three to five, there's so much for them. But this is also good for Stacy, for you and Joanne. Um, it's K, it's, it says K-2 math stations, but it's American. So a lot of the concepts that are in here could go to grade three. But it's, it's, I'll leave these two copies here so the K-2 teachers can kind of just float around and, and look at them. But looking at the table of contents, there it's um, math workstations. So if you wanted to try to do like guided math in your, in your class, these activities are phenomenal in here. Like you pick and choose through them. But at the back, they have problem-solving cards for geometry, problem-solving cards. Like, these are cute little questions that you can put in evidence balls, and you can have as a journal question, or you could just have it as a topic of discussion in the lower grades. It's an excellent, excellent book. We just got these in April. So that's it. I just wanted to kind of end up with this. Assessment's kind of like a buffet. You have to pick what assessment practices work best for you in your class, not to overwhelm yourself. But you have to have that balance of formative and summative assessment. So I hope I didn't bore you. I hope it kind of just kind of was like a bit of a refresher and a review. And I hope you got at least one or two ideas.